Economic Forum on Africa, brought to you by First Bank, truly the first. Well, a recent note from Investec talks about positioning for the end of the easing cycle. This as economic data is now showing more clearly that the worst of the crisis to be behind us. So where are the opportunities waiting to be found? Joining us from our studios in Lagos to discuss just this, Stephen Jennings Group, CEO of the Renaissance Group. Thanks so much, Stephen, for joining us this afternoon. Well, reading one of your quotes, I mean, you've said that the size of opportunity generally exists in direct proportion to the size of the crisis, suggesting that we're amidst great opportunity right now. So where exactly is this opportunity be, to be found, in your opinion? I think it's pretty clear to everybody we're living in a, a two-speed world now. You know, the West is might and debt, structural problems, aging populations and very low growth. And on the other hand, we have five billion plus people living in very dynamic, fast-growing, rapidly changing economies. And, you know, that's where the economy, that's where the opportunity is and that, that's where the money's going. Well, for uh, investors, uh, uncertainty and risk-taking are two things that just don't but, and I mean, when you speak of uh, these opportune uh, times, I mean, emerging markets kind of spring to mind here. Uh, let's look at the potential of emerging markets in the current climate. You know, we're, we're seeing this big movement of capital already. We're, we're actually, we're back into a big emerging market cycle. If you look at the performance of the, the Russian, the, the, Ch the Chinese and the Indian equity markets over the last three months, and more recently, in fact, the African equity markets, it's clear that global investors recognize that there are tremendous opportunities, there's tremendous value uh, in those geographies. Well, the financial crisis is largely being seen as a developed world crisis, uh, but we have seen that the developing world has not been left unscathed amidst it all. I mean, we're certainly seeing these economies sitting uh, on growth curves, uh, uh, you know, not sitting on those growth curves that they had been on in the past. So one would have assumed, though, that uh, this entire scenario would the light a bit for emerging uh, markets, and especially the African continent. You know, not necessarily. We have to look, we have to appreciate the magnitude of the crisis that we've been through, and I think the key thing to look at is relative performance. But, you know, OECD is looking at minus 4% GDP growth. India is looking at 6 to 6 and a half. That's, that's a 10.5 percentage point differential, and that's without precedent. If we look at sub-Saharan Africa, the region was growing at 6.5% going into the region, going into the crisis. It still has in the order of 2% GDP growth. So on a relative basis, mm -hmm. I mean, that is excellent. Many and that, that, shows that, that shows that what Africa had wasn't based on a commodity boom was based on sustainable underlying structural change. Let's look at that because the perception is that a lot of the growth that these economies have experienced has been based on the fact that we've been a strong commodity exporters and uh, now the perception the global demand waning for commodities were going to be put under pressure. So what's ac actually keeping us afloat here? I think it's, it's a myth. It's a, it's a simplistic explanation of what has happened in a lot of the emerging markets. I think if you look across the emerging market universe, the non-natural resource economies, including the likes of China and India, have certainly done at least as well as the rest of that uh, universe and perhaps better. If we look within sub-Saharan Africa and we break out, depending on, on, on resource availability, again, the non-resource economies have done extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, smaller countries like Rwanda, with that, which don't have strong resource base, for example, performing very, very well from a GDP growth standpoint. Let's pinpoint a few examples on the African continent. I mean, the top two that really stand out for you and why? You know, I'm here in Lagos, so if we just focus on a couple of things in Nigeria and West Africa, we've been very bullish on ETI, uh, which is the big pan-regional commercial bank operating in 24 markets. Uh, we put a research piece out on the 9th, 9th of June. At that point, the stock was trading at about 8.8 uh, Naira. The stock's at 15 Naira at limit up today. So we, we have a target of 20 Naira, which we think is very conservative. So we see tremendous, a tremendous franchise and tremendous uh, structural growth potential there. Staying with financial services with a, with a Nigerian name, Access Bank, very fast growing, mm -hmm. very dynamic, committed to state-of-the-art technology and risk management tremendous growth in front of them and again we see a, a lot of upside in that.
particular name. Well, certainly that banking arena in Nigeria has been in the spotlight of late. So with that in mind, how do investors begin to weigh the investment opportunity against risk right now? You know, again, risk is relative. But if we talk about financial services, where we risk and where we've seen management failure and regulatory failure, it's been in the West. So, you know, I, I think investors are increasingly cognizant of that. They're cognizant of the fact that the Western markets, there's low growth, there's a lot of structural problems, there are a lot mm -hmm. of balance sheet issues for banks. So the better managed banks in sub-Saharan Africa, their risk characteristics they, they, they perform very favorably on a relative basis. Well, as investors then search for these alternative investment theses, I mean, do you see the shift really happening in terms of investment flow targeting? Power Lunch, sponsored by Altec, leading technologies, touching lives.